Okay. So yesterday, yesterday we were talking about binding energy, right? We talked about holding the nucleus together. Okay? And we said this is all accomplished through a force that we call the what? What do we call it? Strong force. Strong force. Okay? The strong force is one of the four fundamental forces that exist. We've talked about these before. Okay? So we have the strong force. Okay? We have the electromagnetic force. And we have what we call the weak force. And then we have the fourth one, which is what? Which we've talked about a lot. The gravity. Gravity. Okay? Now, scientists can be a little bit compulsive in their organization. Okay? Scientists like to organize things. They like to put things in boxes. They like to classify things. They like to come up with organizational systems. Okay? And so as scientists started studying the physics of the atom, okay, and as they started studying the physics just in general of the universe, they wanted to organize things. Okay? And so ultimately what scientists came up with is what we call the standard model of physics. Okay? And the standard model of physics has two components to it. Okay, it has the fundamental forces and it has the particles. So we'll talk about the forces first. So the four fundamental forces, we've talked about all of these. The strong force acts on what? Where does it act? Where does it exist? Nucleus. Nucleus, nucleus only. Okay? So the strong force would be what we call a short range force. Incredibly powerful, but only across really, really, really small distances. Okay. The electromagnetic force, what's that? What's the electromagnetic? Point charge, right? That's electrostatic. But it usually interacts with anything that either has a charge or a magnetic field around. Yes? Yeah? Now, this could be two point charges. What else is electromagnetic that we've talked about? Like the electromagnetic. Spectrum, which would be what? Fancy way of saying? Like light. Okay? So the electromagnetic force is what's responsible for what we think of as light. Then we have the weak force, which is the one that we've talked about the least, which is involved in radioactive decay. So last year, when you guys learned about all those radioactive decays and emissions and stuff like that that come out, beta decay, alpha decay, remember all these things? Yes? The force that drives that is the weak force. Once again, it acts across a very small distance. And then we've got gravity. Okay? Gravity acts across incredibly large distances. But in the grand scheme of things, it's actually the weakest of the four. Okay. It basically goes in the order that it's written on the board. The strong is the strongest, followed by the electromagnetic, followed by the weak, and then gravity being the weakest. Yes. Can you repeat the weak force? Radio, uh, radiation, radioactive decay. Okay. Now, what physicists discovered is that these forces actually have tiny little particles which carry them through space. Okay? Matter exchanges these particles, and that's what allows the forces to exist. So we call them force-carrying particles. Okay? Okay? 
So we have we have carrying particles. There's carrying particles. Okay? Their general scientific name is the boson. But for each force, they have a specific name. So there's a boson for the strong force, there's bosons for the electromagnetic force, and there are bosons for the weak force. Okay? The strong force, its force carrying particle, is called the gluon. Why? Because it acts like and holds the weak and the weak together, right? Remember, the strong force is the chain. So the gluon is what does it. It's the glue. What carries electromagnetic energy? Photons. Photons. Okay. And then for the weak force, we have a couple of them. So we have what we call the W and the Z boson. Okay, and then there's gravity, and gravity is like the weird stepchild in the family. He doesn't quite fit. Okay, there's something off of him. Okay, the standard model standard model works really well at explaining everything that's going on with these guys and everything that's going on with the particles, and it does a really good job. The second you try to stick gravity in there, it goes to hell. The reason why is gravity is explained really, really well by Einstein. Theory of relativity and all those sorts of things, special relativity and all that stuff. When you try to stick him together with the quantum theory stuff that we talked about with Planck, you get answers that give you that. Can you have that fraction? No. No. Okay, that's a problem. Or you get fractions that give you an answer of that. What's that? Can you have an answer of infinity? No. Okay, so the problem that we have is trying to unify what we know about gravity, because we do know a lot about it, and what we know about the forces. Figure it out, and guess what you win? Nobel Prize. Yay! You can figure out a grand unification theory, you'll be famous. But, the other problem that we have with gravity is that we haven't found its particle yet. Okay? We think... It exists. It should exist. We found the waves that correspond to gravity. We found gravity waves. So whenever there's a wave, everything has a double nature, so there should be a wave and there should be a particle. We don't know, we haven't discovered it yet. Find a particle, guess what you win? Nobel Prize. Now the particle for gravity is called a graviton. Theoretically. I haven't found it yet. Everybody got that? Yes? Cool. So that takes care of the forces. But now we got to look at the other side of the coin, which is the particles. Okay? Now, if you take this in college, this is a semester long course. I'm going to teach it to you in 15 minutes. This should be fun. Okay. So, when we talk about particle physics, right? What the hell are we talking about? All right. Remember when you were a little kid and there was something that you had in your house? Could be your dad's watch, could be the remote control, could be a toy car. And you wanted to know how it worked. What the hell was inside it? So what did you do? Tim, I'm guessing you did this a lot. What did you do? No comment. Tim, what did you do? No comment. Okay, class, what do we think Tim did when he wanted to discover how something works? Took it apart, because we all did that. Sometimes you were okay, your parents were like, oh, so inquisitive. Other times when you took apart, like, you know, 
the remote control is tapped, they weren't so happy. Generally speaking, my dad was proud of me. <laughs> okay? When we're little kids and we want to discover what things are made of, we take them apart. Okay? Now, physicists are no different. They want to know what makes up matter. And that's what we've been doing, and we did all through chemistry last year. We started with a big chunk of material and you broke it down to molecules. Then you take those molecules and you break them down to atoms. Then you take those atoms and you break them down to subatomic parts. Okay? But the question you had, some of, one of you may have asked it, okay, or you may have asked it in your head, is okay, so we have a proton. What the hell is a proton made of? Okay? So you have it, and you keep breaking stuff down, and you get smaller and smaller and smaller. So what the hell is a proton made of? Well, this is the wonder, the same thing. The problem is, when you want to see what your dad's watch is made of, you take a tiny little screwdriver, you open it up, and you can take it apart. Okay? When you want to see what a proton is made of, they don't quite make that screwdriver yet. Okay? There's a Phillips head, there's a flat head, there's a hex head, there's no proton head for a, a screwdriver. Okay? So how the hell do we figure it out? Well, we could take really good ideas from just looking at the world around us. It's one of the best ways to figure out how to do things. And one of the things that scientists realize is, let's say you have two cars. And they're flying down the highway, but then one of them is going the wrong way. And they hit 55 miles per hour. Now the car is going to be what? Totally and utterly destroyed. There's going to be pieces everywhere. But if you walked over to that car crash and looked at the shards that were all over the floor, you could get a pretty good idea of what the car was made of. There's some metal, there's some glass, loose human hair. Push that over. Okay? Plastic, right? Uh, you can see all of those devices, maybe one of the dials off the radio came off, right? Uh, tinted glass, regular glass. All so you can get an idea of what the car was made of just by the stuff that was left over when you smashed the car up. Yes? So scientists said, so why don't we do the same thing? Let's take some atoms, relatively light ones like hydrogen, and take them and another set of hydrogen and just make a car crash. And when they hit, they will shatter, hopefully. You can make them go at just the right speed, and hit at just the right angle, they'll collide with each other. And when they collide with each other, they'll break, and we can see what they're made of. And that's exactly what they do. They created what we call... Does the pen not want to work for me now? Particle accelerators. Okay? The mid 20th century to the late 20th century, labs all across the United States and China and Europe were creating these giant particle accelerators, and they still continue to do it to this day. And what they basically are is giant tubes where they put a bunch of atoms and they make them accelerate as fast as they can, and they bring them close to the speed of light, which is easy because they're relatively low mass. We do this with magnets and all sorts of things. Okay? And what you basically do is you take a bunch of atoms at one end, you take a bunch of atoms at the other end, and you shoot these this way, and these this way, and what are they going to do in the middle? Smashy, smashy. Technical science. Smashy, you need hydrogen gas, put hydrogen gas in the tube. You know that's there. Yes. Okay? Now, in order to get it to the speed of light, and since they're so small, you gotta keep whipping them around and whipping them around and whipping them around and whipping them around and whipping them around. But eventually, some of them will collide. You put enough rotation, some are gonna hit. And exactly that's exactly what happens. Smack dab in the middle, you're gonna get a boom. Once again, technical science term. Okay? And you're basically going to get atomic shrapnel. Little bits of material. Smaller than the hole they're going to be littering for. Okay? And so scientists kept doing this and doing this and smashing them, smashing them, smashing them, smashing them, smashing them. And every time they smash them with the technology, we get a little bit better, they can make them smash at higher speeds. And the higher the speed they smash them together, the smaller the pieces they got. 
right? If you got into a car accident at 25 miles an hour, your car would be messed up. If you got into a car accident at 90 miles per hour, you'd be dead, okay? And your car would be really messed up. What car? Just any 90 miles per hour, just about anything. Don't try it. Yeah, well, actually, yeah. I'm sure. Okay? Please don't. <laughs> okay? Now, does that make sense? When they did this, what they discovered is that protons and neutrons and electrons and all these other things that were in there had little pieces to them. But they discovered a load of them. Just a crap load of them. And they were all over the place. We had all these different scientists. All of the world talking about all these different things, and science went, Whoa! We can't. We can't have you saying this and you saying that. And the whole point of this was to make sense of the universe. And now we got a bunch of crap all over the place. And so what they did is they came up with this model, this standard model. Okay? And if you look at page three of your reference table, okay? You'll see. This is a lovely chart. Yeah. And so if you look at this lovely chart, we said, okay, we've got matter. Okay? And when they first smashed it up, what they realized, okay, before they even got started was we gotta split these things up even. And so they split it into two groups. We have this group of things called hadrons, which are heavy, and leptons, which are relatively light. Okay? But there was even more than that. Hadrons Interact with all four fundamental forces strong, weak, gravity, and electromagnetic. Leptons, which are much, much lighter, in fact, they are smaller than a proton, only interact with three. interact with the electromagnetic weak and gravity. Okay? Now, if we look at the chart, we discover there were a couple of different types of leptons. The most common lepton, and the one that you know the best about, is the first one that's listed on that chart. What is that? The electron. Okay? The electron, we see the symbol that we use for the electron, the E, right? And underneath it, we discover the charge of negative 1E, yes? Yeah? Cool? But as we kept smashing things, we discovered that there were these other weird particles that existed as well. We had particles called muons and tau's, okay? Their masses were different than the electron, and what's called their spin was different. Yes, sir? How did they, like, discover it? So when you... It's effectively what I said. You smash the particles together, and when you look at the pieces that are left, you can identify that piece as an electron. Yeah, but like, how do you look at it? Oh, you've got uh, different uh, ways that it interacts with different matter. You run it through a scratching gradient, you look at the uh, photoelectric effects, things like that. You see how they interact. Okay? Okay? And so we discovered this thing called the muon and the tau. Okay? That also have the same charge, but a slightly different in terms of spin, which is the way that they move. Okay, and mass. And then we discovered these things called neutrinos. Neutrinos have almost no charge and almost no mass. In fact, they're called ghost particles. They were theorized to have been created and have since been discovered to have been created primarily due to supernova. 
when stars go kaplawi, they spit these out. In fact, right now, trillions upon trillions of neutrinos are passing through your head, through your body, and into the ground. They pass through the Earth, just like ghosts. That's why we call them ghost particles. Make sense? Yeah. Now, hadron. Hadrons are going to be things that you're used to, like protons and neutrons and then a couple of weird ones that you're not used to. When they smash hadrons together, like a proton, they finally figured it out. They finally figured out what they're made of. They discovered that there were these little particles that existed only for a fleeting second. But they had something weird about them. They had a partial or a fractional charge. They weren't plus one, they weren't minus one. They were like two thirds of a charge, a third of a charge. Now, your brains from chemistry are hardwired to say that that's impossible. It's obviously not. But it only exists at the very, very, very self subatomic level and only for a We call these particles that have partial charges and make up hadrons quarks. I don't know why they're named the way they do. They were discovered in the 60s. A lot of them were named in California. 60s, California, you know what was going on over there. Okay? So as we discovered, we discovered different generations of quarks. The first one we discovered was the up and the down quark. Okay? The up quark has a charge of positive two-thirds. The down quark has a charge of minus two-thirds. When we smash the proton together, protons had a char had an up, an up, and a down. When you do that math, what do you get? You get three over three, yes? Which is positive one. Neutron or an up and two downs, which gives you a charge of a big fat zero. Then we discovered other ones like charms and tops and bottoms. And eventually we discovered stuff that looked like matter but moved the opposite way and called that antimatter. And ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages, you have finished visit. You survived. Good job. Congratulations. I will see all of you on Monday virtually. This weekend. I, today, like just last period, I remembered to forward you the email about like the messed up test wizard. They're just forwarding.